Magic and Yu-Gi-Oh have a lot of similarities and a lot of differences, both in terms of things like rules and how they play. Being two of the biggest trading card games in the world, people will often try to cross over between the two of them. So today, we're going to make a guide to help both Magic and Yu-Gi-Oh players understand the differences between the two games. First off, the text written on cards are called effects in Yu-Gi-Oh, but called abilities in Magic. The Exile and Banner Zone are exactly the same, and Magic calls its deck the Library. The biggest, most obvious difference you'll see is the game's resource system. Both games have some resource in common, such as life, cards in hand, cards in graveyard, and board presence. However, there are some major resources that are very different. Magic's unique resource system is lands. Lands produce mana, which you use to cast your spells, and you can only play one land each turn. Every turn, you can tap each of your lands to add one mana, and at the beginning of your turn, you can untap all of your permanents, including your lands. Similar to Magic, where you only get one land drop a turn, in Yu-Gi-Oh, you only get one normal summon a turn, letting you summon a level 4 lower monster from your hand for free. However, Yu-Gi-Oh also uses these monsters on field as a resource, as most of the game's summoning mechanics require using monsters from your field to summon other later monsters. Currently, there are seven summoning mechanics in Yu-Gi-Oh! Tribute, Fusion, Ritual, Synchro, Xyz, Pendulum, and Link Summoning. The goal of most Yu-Gi-Oh! decks is filling the board with imposing boss monsters. Additionally, it should be mentioned that outside of monsters, there's no cost to using cards except what's printed on them. If you draw a monster reborn, you can just activate it right away. Whereas in Magic, you need mana for cards like Reanimate. This is why Divination is fine in Magic, but Pot of Greed is banned in Yu-Gi-Oh! Because in Yu-Gi-Oh! the card has no cost at all, making it a free staple that every deck would use. This has a lot of implications on how the games play. First off, because the resources you use in Yu-Gi-Oh! just go away when you use them, whereas in Magic, players slowly get more and more mana as the game goes on, in Magic, players get stronger the later game goes on. For example, players will start replacing cards like Goblin Guide on turn 1 and end up casting much bigger and stronger creatures like Siege Rhino, which can easily overpower the guide and has a much bigger impact on the game. On the other hand, in Yu-Gi-Oh, players will usually try to find a way to use as many cards on their first turn to set up big, impactful plays, usually so many cards like Baron de Fleur, who has the effect where you can negate and destroy a card your opponent controls once it's on the field. And once per turn, you can also just destroy any card on the field. Another big difference is that in Magic, you have to choose between developing your board or interacting with your opponent a lot of the time. Because your mana is limited, you can either play interaction spells or cast a threat, and you have to choose what to spend your mana on. In Yu-Gi-Oh, most of your interactions are threats as well. Cards like the previously mentioned Barone are both able to close games quickly and capable of interacting with your opponent's combos. Another example would be Totally Awesome, which can negate and steal one of your opponent's cards, setting up your board. So unlike Magic, where you often have to choose between interactions and threats, in Yu-Gi-Oh, your threats are often interactive themselves, on top of your spell trap cards that interact with your opponent. While we're talking about resource systems, we need to bring up a strange resource system that Yu-Gi-Oh has. Yu-Gi-Oh! is governed by what players call a hard once per turns. For example, look at the difference between the text of a card like Sprite Blue versus something like Barone's Destruction Effect. Blue's text specifically mentions the card by name, whereas Barone's Pop doesn't. This means that all three copies of your Blue are restricted by that once per turn clause at the same time. For an example, if you use Blue's Effect to add a Sprite card from your deck to your hand, then make Gigantic Sprite, you can use Gigantic's effect to special summon another copy of blue from your deck. However, even though you've met the condition for blue's effect to trigger, you can't activate it, because you already have used the effect earlier this turn. Magic doesn't have anything like this, mostly because it doesn't need to. Magic's mana system does the same job as these hard ones per turns, restricting lengthy combos. Another interesting note is how Magic handles soft ones per turns, like Barone has. Most of the time, when Magic wants to give a card an ability that it can use once a turn, they use the tap system instead. They only really use hard ones per turns on triggered abilities like those of Jin Gatax's Progress Tyrant. Now, both games do share some resource systems, but they place a different amount of importance on them. Yu-Gi-Oh! usually cares a bit more about card advantages than Magic, but it's pretty close. Magic values life points a lot more than Yu-Gi-Oh! does, as having more life can be the difference between getting another turn or not. But in Yu-Gi-Oh! Players can put enough damage to end the game in one turn very easily. Now, Magic players still often joke about how bad life gain cards are, but they're still seen far more play in Magic than in Yu-Gi-Oh. Yu-Gi-Oh also usually values cards in its graveyard more, as there's much higher density of good cards with graveyard effects in Yu-Gi-Oh, though both games have had their fair share of strong graveyard-focused strategies. One thing that Yu-Gi-Oh players get wrong when talking about Magic is calling all instants hand traps. This is a phrase in Yu-Gi-Oh! for cards you can activate directly from your hand during your opponent's turn to interact with their plays. Yu-Gi-Oh! players will often call all instants hand traps because they can be used directly from your hand. Hand traps are so important because they can be used during your opponent's first turn while you're going second, and your opponent can't see them coming. 
In Yu-Gi-Oh, you can see traps coming because your opponent has to set them before using them, and if they want to activate any spell cards on your turn, they'll have to set them as well. Similarly, in Magic, you can tell if your opponent is holding an instant speed spell up by leaving their mana untapped. And since you need mana to cast them, you can't cast instants on your opponent's first turn going second. This means that instants aren't really similar to hand traps in the most important ways. However, there are instants that can work as hand trap-like cards. The most famous of them is Forza Will, a counter spell which can be cast for free by exiling a blue card from your hand and paying one life instead of paying mana. Instants that cost zero mana could actually be likened to hand traps pretty accurately, though those are pretty rare in Magic. Next, let's cover how the games handle their formats. Magic has a ton of formats, and most of them receive quite a bit of official support from Wizards themselves. I've made an entire video about all the Magic formats, but the gist is, Magic has Standard, a rotating format of the last two years worth of cards, then a series of several formats that have more and more cards in them, starting from a certain set and including every set printed since then. Yu-Gi-Oh! on the other hand only has two formats and a few other ways to play that are more based on the platform. Yu-Gi-Oh!'s two major formats are Traditional and Advanced Format. Advanced is what most people think of when they think of Yu-Gi-Oh!, and in Advanced, you can play any cards that have ever been printed that aren't on the ban list. Traditional is similar, but cards are only limited to one rather than being banned. Traditional is analogous to Vintage in Magic, and Advance is basically the same as Legacy. Vintage also only limits cards to one, whereas Legacy has a more traditional ban list. Now, in addition to these formats, Magic has tons of other formats for people to play with a much smaller card pool and lower power level. Yu-Gi-Oh! has a few things to fill a similar role, though they also have some extra rules. Duel Links is a lower power level version of the game with quite a few rule changes such as fewer card zones and skills, which are basically extra abilities you can activate that aren't tied to your cards. Speed Duels is very similar, but is played in paper instead of digitally. There is also Master Duel, which is basically just a normal TCG, but it has its own ban list and doesn't get the cards quite as soon. Now, those are all the supported formats of Yu-Gi-Oh!, but the community has been delving into reviving older formats for a while now. For example, Goat Format, named after the card Scapegoat, refers to the format of the summer 2005. No newer cards ever enter the format, people just play with whatever cards are legal at the time. Now, before we go, I want to say that I know a lot of people are interested in trying out Yu-Gi-Oh, but get turned off by how powerful and fast the modern game is. If that's how you feel, you might want to look around at these historical formats to see if there's one that plays more in line with what you want. Konami has even shown interest in supporting these fan-made formats, what they're calling Time Wizard, which is basically just these alternate formats sanctioned by Konami. At the very least, you'll be able to find some people to play with on a simulator online if you're interested. One very notable difference between the two games is how they handle the combat slash battle phase. The first difference that jumps out to people is the lack of summoning sickness in Yu-Gi-Oh! In Magic, creatures can't attack or use their tap abilities the turn they come under your control. Yu-Gi-Oh! has no such restrictions. Any monster that comes into play can attack with no issue. The other major difference is how combat is conducted. In Magic, the attacking player chooses any number of untapped creatures as attackers and chooses who or what they're attacking, if there are things like planeswalkers on the battlefield, and then the opponent can choose any number of their untapped creatures as blockers. Then, each attacking and blocking creature deals damage equal to their power to whatever creatures they're being blocked by slash blocking. There's no piercing battle damage unless the creature has trample, so a big creature being blocked by 1-1 won't deal damage to your opponent. There's more to it, of course, but that's the short version. In Yu-Gi-Oh, however, things work completely differently. In that game, you can't attack your opponent directly at all if they have any monsters. Instead, you choose which of their monsters to attack with your own monsters. One by one, each of your monsters can attack one of their monsters once each. Since you're attacking, you'll always use your attack stat and compare it to either the attack or defense based on what position your opponent's monster is in. If your attack is higher than their attack or defense, that monster is destroyed. And if they are in attack position, you inflict battle damage to your opponent equal to the difference between their attack stats. All of these differences amount to a pretty big difference in how these games play. You see, in Yu-Gi-Oh!, the attacking player has the advantage, whereas in Magic, the defending player often has the advantage. In Yu-Gi-Oh!, the attacking player gets to choose what monsters attack which monsters, giving them the ability to choose the most favorable matchups for each and every attack. In Magic, however, it's the defending player who gets to choose which creatures have to go against which creatures. This ends up changing how the games feel to play a lot, contributing to the fast feel of Yu-Gi-Oh! and the more slow and methodical feeling of Magic. In Magic, creature-based decks often grind to a standstill. Both players could have a big board full of big, imposing threats, but not be able to push for lethal. Worse, their opponent could survive the attack, and since all of your creatures are now tapped, you can't block on your next turn. This allows them to retaliate, possibly ending the game on their turn. This means that players can sit with huge board states, both players have enough damage on board to end the game, and not attacking, as it would actually leave them in a disadvantageous position. This basically never happens in Yu-Gi-Oh!, as the attacking player can choose which fights are the most advantageous for them. 
This means that in Yu-Gi-Oh, a monster can effectively be answered by a bigger monster, whereas in Magic, you can often still get some value out of your 2-2s after your opponent plays a 3-3. This also means that one big monster can effectively stall your opponent's attacks in Yu-Gi-Oh, as no amount of attacking will destroy it if all your monsters are smaller than it. In Magic, each creature can only block one other creature, so a board full of small creatures can be as imposing as one with a few big creatures. Another big difference between the two games is how they split all their card pools. In Magic, cards are split up by color. You need lands that tap for specific colors of mana to cast spells of that color. If you want to cast a blue spell, you need an island. However, there are no such restrictions in Yu-Gi-Oh. Any deck could, theoretically, play any card in it. However, in the modern day, Konami has cut up with a new way to divide the card pull-up, mainly with what the community calls archetypes. In Yu-Gi-Oh, an archetype refers to a set of cards that are all designed to work together. For example, the branded archetype are a series of cards that all work together, most other fusion monsters requiring you to use a specific monster as a material, Fallen of Albats. Though this deck has some restrictions, one of their best cards, Branded Fusion, makes it so you can only summon fusion monsters from your extract for the rest of the turn. This makes it so that you can only really play the branded cards with cards that don't care about that restriction. This solves the problem of everyone just playing the best cards no matter what their game plan is. Though there are still some staples that every deck can play, like Ash Blossom, whereas in Magic, each color has its own staples. Another big difference between how the games play is how wordy the average cards are. If you've seen the memes, you're probably aware of cards like Endymion, the Mighty Master of Magic. Yu-Gi-Oh cards, on average, tend to just be a lot wordier than Magic cards. Now, a lot of this can be chalked up to formatting choices, as Magic does do a much better job of keywording abilities and making its text much more succinct. But the average Yu-Gi-Oh card most players' decks will have more effects and more complex effects than the average Magic card. This is due to the very different design philosophies of the game, as well as needing to introduce a ton of restrictions on cards like the previously mentioned hard ones per turns. In Magic, cards typically have one very specific job in a deck and only need a few lines of text to establish that purpose. Lightning Bolt deals damage. Divination draws you cards. Goblin Guide is good at attacking your opponent. However, in Yu-Gi-Oh, cards often have to do a lot more. Take Mirror Jade the Ice Blade Dragon, for example. This card is supposed to be a big and born threat, so it has to have multiple upsides. It can, once per turn, send a fusion monster from its archetype to the graveyard to banish a monster with some additional restrictions, and when it leaves the field because of an opponent's card effect, you can also destroy all of your opponent's monsters at the end of the turn. Now, the reason it sends fusion monsters from the archetype is because some of the other cards in the archetype, like Albion, have effects that can activate if they're in your graveyard, so sending them is often an upside. Now, Mirror Jade is a more complex card than a lot of magic cards, but in magic terms, it only has one activated ability and one triggered ability that are both really strong. All the other text is just restrictions a card needs to work within the game. So it is true that Yu-Gi-Oh monsters have a lot of text on them and are pretty complicated, but it's a lot less daunting than it looks at first. Another big difference worth mentioning is the fact that Yu-Gi-Oh has card zones. To clear this up, by zones, we're referring to the individual places that cards can be placed on the field, not things like the hand, field, and graveyard, like the term is used in Magic. In Yu-Gi-Oh, each player has five monster card zones, five spell or trap zones, one field spell zone, and it has two extra deck monster zones in the middle of the playfield that each player can summon one extra deck monster to. What this means is that you can only have a maximum of six monsters on the board, five spell traps in your back row, and one field spell. If all those zones are full, you just can't play anything else from your hand. The field zones have some extra implications too, as link monsters have a mechanic where they can only be summoned to the extra monster zone or a monster zone that a link monster is pointing to. Additionally, there are cards that care about what column cards are in, such as infinite impermanence, which has an effect that counters all spell and trap cards in the column it was activated in for the rest of the turn. Magic doesn't have any mechanics in certain card placements. You also don't have to worry about filling the board with too many creatures or anything similar, as you can cast as many creature spells as you want. This is actually pretty important, as Splinter Twin decks relied on being able to create an infinite number of creature tokens to kill their opponent. Finally, the most important difference between how the two games play is the extra deck, Yu-Gi-Oh's most famous and unique mechanic. In Yu-Gi-Oh, you choose 15 extra deck monster cards when constructing your deck to put to the side, and you can summon those monsters whenever you have the proper materials on the field, or when an effect like a fusion spell lets you summon one of these monsters. This changes the way the game plays entirely. Players will always have access to these cards every game, and most decks are built around the extra deck. Not only does the extra deck provide a lot of consistency, but some of the strongest monsters in the game are extra deck monsters. The fact that Magic doesn't have an extra deck changes how the game is played entirely. Deck building is already a different enough process in the two games, but not knowing you'll necessarily have access to any of your cards means that you have to build your decks differently, either running more redundant effects or more draw effects to find them. Luckily, card draw is more common in Magic, so Magic decks can run a lot of consistency boosters if they want. Interestingly, Magic does have some formats with similar mechanics to the extra deck, or mechanics that sort of emulate it, 
and it does change the way people build decks. First off is Commander. This is a format where players choose a legendary creature and then start with that card in the commander zone, and they can cast that card from the commander zone whenever they could normally cast it. People usually build their decks around synergies with the commander, similar to Yu-Gi-Oh! A mechanic that feels a little similar to the extra deck are Wishes. These are cards that let you find cards, usually of certain card type, from your sideboard and put it into your hand. This allows you to build a sort of toolbox of useful cards that you can get that aren't actually in your main deck, similar to how a lot of extra decks are used, though there is some variance there. Additionally, you only have access to those cards with your Wishes, so they're harder to get access to than most extra deck monsters. Finally, the last similar mechanic in Magic is Companions. This is a pretty infamous mechanic, but how it works, if you meet your chosen companion's requirement, you pay 3 mana to put it in your hand from your sideboard. This mechanic is pretty close to having one extra deck monster, or having a commander in that format. Now, the reason this mechanic was disliked by the community are pretty complicated, but I want to reassure any cautious magic player that the extra deck is a lot less stifling than the companions were. Whereas there are only 10 companions in magic, there are tons of extra deck monsters in Yu-Gi-Oh, giving decks tons of room for deck building potential. Even if they don't want to summon from the extra deck, they can just banish it with cards like Pot of Extravagance. The extra deck certainly changes the way the game plays, but Yu-Gi-Oh has accounted for that and made the game far more hospitable to these mechanics than Magic did. One of the most important, more ruling-focused differences are the differences between the stack and the chain. These are the system that the games uses to determine what certain effects will resolve. They both work on a first-in, last-out system, where the last thing that was put on the stack or chain resolves first, and then the thing that was put on right before that, and so on and so forth. However, this is where the similarities end. You see, in Magic, players get priority after each spell or ability on the stack resolves. This can let you do some pretty interesting things. For example, let's say you have a momentary blink on the stack, and you cast Dual Caster Mage. Dual Caster's ability will trigger and give you a second copy of Blink, and will let you change its target to the mage itself. Now, the stack will consist of Blink and the copy you just made, so Blink will resolve, and its effect to exile the Dual Caster and then return to the battlefield will resolve. This will cause Dual Caster's ability to trigger again, letting you get another copy of Blink and repeat this process. The important part of this interaction, for our purposes, is that the original copy of Blink never leaves the stack. We allow other spells and abilities to put onto the stack after resolving one of them. This is entirely different to the chain in Yu-Gi-Oh! Once the chain starts resolving, the entire chain has to resolve all at once. This prevents any sort of loops like the Dual Caster Mage loop from being possible, if Yu-Gi-Oh! had analogies for those cards. One thing that's worth going over briefly is the speed of cards. This is a term that's used to describe when cards can be activated. Both games have their own terminology to describe this. Magic has a simpler naming scheme. Everything is either instant speed or sorcery speed. Sorceries are a card type that can only be cast on your own turn during the main phase while the stack is empty. Instants, on the other hand, can be cast at any time you have priority. This leads to the term sorcery speed and instant speed. Yu-Gi-Oh! has analogies for this, but they have a different set of terms for this, called spell speeds. Spell speed 1 is the same thing as sorcery speed, and spell speed 2 is the same thing as instant speed. However, spell speed 3 and 4 are entirely different. Spell speed 3 is reserved for counter trap cards only, which are denoted by this little symbol next to the card text name. The only thing that can respond to a spell speed 3 effect is another spell speed 3 effect, meaning that your Barone can't do anything against your opponent's Solemn Strike, since it's a counter trap card. However, there is also what the community calls spell speed 4 effects. These are things like Axis Code Talker, who has the effect that your opponent can't activate cards or effects in response to this card's effects. Interestingly, Magic used to have something like this very similar to spell speed 3 cards. Back in the old days of the game, there was a card type called Interrupts, which were faster than instants, and you could only play other interrupts in response to an interrupt. Originally, cards like Counterspell were interrupts, whereas nowadays, they're just instants. This is basically the same thing as Counter Traps, but Magic decided this was a frustrating and unfun mechanic and decided to change the rules. There are also a few things that are somewhat similar to Spell Speed 4 effects in Magic. First off are a few things that the game calls Special Action. These include playing a land, flipping a morph card face up, and putting a companion from outside the game into your hand. These simply can't be responded to, and happen right away. Another similar mechanic is the split second keyword, which has the effect where players can't cast spells or activate abilities while they're on the stack. Abilities can still trigger, however. For example, if there's a Chalice of the Void with three counters on the board, and you cast a Cross on Grip, Chalice will still counter it. The final thing you can do without your opponent having a chance to respond is activate mana abilities, like tapping your lands. In fact, you can actually activate mana abilities at times you can't cast anything else or activate any other abilities, like in response to a split-second card or while paying mana to cast a spell. 
So you could almost say that mana abilities are spell speed 5. One more thing we should mention about the games is when you're allowed to activate card effects based on how they're written. In Magic, all activated abilities are instant speed unless stated otherwise. In Yu-Gi-Oh, however, these same sort of activated effects can only be activated at spell speed 1 unless stated otherwise. For example, Barone's pop effect is spell speed 1 only. One really thing that's not in Magic is chain blocking. Chain blocking is usually the order that effects are put onto the chain to stop your opponent from being able to negate key cards. For an example, let's say you have a Sand Gun and a Witch of the Black Forest go to the graveyard at the same time, and you want to resolve the effect of Witch of the Black Forest to search out Jinzo. What you do is choose for Witch to trigger first, then Sand Gan's effect to trigger second. Then your opponent gets a chance to activate to a card effect in response. Say they choose their Hand Trap Ash Blossom, which can negate a search effect as an example. Now, since Ash Blossom's ability to negate searching effects can only activate whenever one of those effects has been activated, and the last effect that was activated wasn't Witch of the Black Forest, this means you can make your Witch of the Black Forest immune to Ash's effect, which considering how strong the effect is, is extremely good. This is a technique that just doesn't exist in Magic, which will be good or bad depending on if you like chain blocking as a mechanic or not. Both games also handle when players get priority differently. Let's say you're playing Magic and you have a Hero's Downfall and your opponent casts an Obnixilis Reignited. You can't destroy it while it's on the stack, so you have to wait for it to resolve and for you to get priority again. However, as soon as it resolves, your opponent gets priority since it's their turn and can activate one of Obnixilis' loyalty abilities. This means that you can't use a removal spell to stop your opponent from activating the ability of a card after they cast it. They'll always get the opportunity to act first. On top of that, since most activated abilities are instant speed, removal very rarely works as a way to shut them down. This is different in Yu-Gi-Oh! as a defending player actually gets a chance to use a removal before your opponent can activate the effects of cards, given that they aren't trigger effects. For an example, look at Gursu the Orcus Mech Knight. This card both has an effect that activates on its summon, and an effect that can activate while on the field. If you have a card like Compulsory Evacuation Device to bounce a monster, you won't be able to stop the effects like Gursu's summon effect from going on the chain, because they happen as soon as he's summoned. However, after the summon happens, and any on summon effects would trigger, you do get a brief window to act before your opponent can activate the effects like Gursu's on the field effect to summon a token. This window doesn't exist in Magic. The reason this change was made was probably due to how the game handles these kinds of effects in general. Lots of these strong effects in Magic are tied to more expensive cards or are tapped abilities on creatures, meaning that your opponent will have time either on their previous turns or on their next turn to do something before you get the effect. The last ruling difference is that in Magic, effects will try to do as much as they can even if they can't fully resolve. But in Yu-Gi-Oh, if an effect can't resolve, you aren't allowed to activate it in the first place. For an easy, famous example, let's use Failing to Find. In Magic, if you use a card that lets you search your library for a certain type of card, like a Goblin card or an Instant Sorcery card, you can use that effect, and if it turns out you don't have a card of that type, you simply fail to find, and if that card has any other effects, they still happen. For example, if you cast Gerard's Orders, which allows you to tutor out two creatures, and put one into your hand and the other into the graveyard. However, if you don't have more than one creature in your deck, you can simply add one creature to your hand, but you won't put one into your graveyard. However, if you have a card like Pendulum Call, which can add two Magician cards from your deck to your hand, you simply aren't allowed to activate the card in the first place if you don't have cards to add to your hand. Interestingly, there are combos in both games that are very similar that are affected by this exact ruling. In Magic, there's a card called Narset Partner of Veils, which has the ability where your opponent can't draw more cards than one card each turn. If you have a Narset out, you can cast something like Wheel of Fortune, which makes both players discard their hand and then draw seven. So what will happen is you'll both discard your hand, then you'll get to draw seven cards, and your opponent will only draw one. Now there's actually a pretty well-known combo in Yu-Gi-Oh that does the same thing, but it brushed up against the ruling we've been talking about. Trickstar Reincarnation has the effect where your opponent banishes their entire hand, and then they draw a card for each card they banished from their hand. By combining this with Draw and Lockbird, a card that can send itself from your hand to the graveyard whenever your opponent adds a card from their deck to their hand to make it so they can't add any more cards from the deck to their hand this turn, including by drawing them. However, you can't simply activate Reincarnation while your opponent is under the effect of Droll because this would be trying to activate a card that can't resolve properly. However, you can get around this. What you do is wait for your opponent to activate an effect that allows you to activate Droll. Then, on the next chain, you activate Reincarnation as Chain Link 1, and Droll on Chain Link 2. The chain will resolve backwards, applying the Droll lock, and then Reincarnation will apply its effect. Since your opponent can't draw cards, they'll banish their whole hand and draw no new cards. However, if you Droll them without activating Reincarnation first, you won't be able to activate Reincarnation at all. Now, there are some more bells and whistles that make this particular interaction work, but that's the gist of it. Alright, and that's the video. Do you have any other differences you think we should have mentioned, or have any ideas for future videos just like this one? If so, leave it in a comment down below.